So, first of all, welcome, good morning, and thank you for joining this uh, session. Um, just a, a brief introduction, um, I'm Colin, and this is Cam. Hello. Um, we are SREs that work as part of a worldwide team supporting the IBM Kubernetes service, um, among other public services, but that's the biggest one that we uh, look after. Um, as you probably guessed from the name, the IBM Kubernetes service, that uh, allows customers to come to our public cloud and provision their own Kubernetes cluster, um, and more recently, uh, Red Hat OpenShift clusters. Um, and they can choose to uh, create the cluster in any of the 23 locations we've got around the world. Um, in addition to providing Kubernetes clusters to our customers, uh, we also have internal customers of our Kubernetes uh, service. Um, because the majority of other IBM public cloud services also run on clusters provisioned by us and run by us, managed by us. Um, in addition to that, we also use our own clusters provisioned for our own control planes as well. So we use it ourselves. Um, but that does mean that we are running Kubernetes on Kubernetes on Kubernetes, which can be a little bit... Um, mind-blowing, but also cool because it means that we can use the same tools, the same automation, the same processes, whether we're dealing with customer clusters, internal customers, our control plane, or even our global control planes. Um, but it also has its pitfalls uh, because it means that when we're using the same tool, we've got to be really careful, our same automation, as to which cluster we're targeting because it could be the case where you're trying to solve an individual customer's cluster problem, but you end up um, you have to be careful that you're only dealing with that cluster and reprovisioning it and not our control plane, which could affect many, many clusters. Uh, and this is a great example of the wrong terminal uh, mistake that we've uh, seen earlier. Um, anyway, in, in the years of running in production, um, we've learned quite a lot. And one of the things I want to share with you, um, and, and it was something where we found that people were saying, just automate it. Okay. Whenever there was toil, whenever there was a problem, when there was an incident, maybe use somebody using the wrong terminal, the answer would be just automate it. And, and, and both of us are from a software engineering background, which, uh, so, you know, for us, that's a really great answer, automate it. Um, we, we, we don't have a sysadmin background um, before we joined SRE. Um, but the assumption, it turned out, was that just by adding automation, everything is solved. Okay? Um, and then there is no need to touch it again. It'll just trundle along in the background, working forever. Um, and, and a couple of years in to the project, we realized that toil was increasing from somewhere. Um, and we had a look. We had a look around to see where it was coming from. And it, we, we found it in, you know, possibly the, the hidden cost from automation was that it was adding more to our toil. So, so this talk, we're going to talk a little bit about where this toil comes from um, and also how we have eliminated it from our automation uh, work. Um, and, and hopefully, it will be at least partially relevant to the environments, or, or maybe completely irrelevant. Um, so first, a couple of definitions. Toil, um, I do like this definition from the SRE book. Uh, in particular, it is something bad. It is something to avoid. I mean, even the name toil automatically gets my heart pounding and thinking, oh, no, I really don't want to do this. You know, this is something I want to avoid. Um, and so it was a great name. Um, and toil is something that gets in the way of making progress, is the way I think of it. Um, and it, it, I mean, some examples are wherever you've got a repetitive manual task, um, so if you end up manually having to reboot, reload, manual patching, adding users, things like that, if you're having to keep doing that, then that's the toil that you've got. Um, and the key for an SRE squad, an SRE team, is to reduce the amount of toil. Um, and you know, it's an often quoted figure of, you know, less than 50%, less than half of the time of the SREs should be spent on toil. Because the rest of the time, you can have the fun, the enjoyable bit, with the project improvement work. That's the bit where you're adding new features uh, or you're reducing future toil. Um, so there's definitely two parts, you know, adding new features, it might be better resiliency, things like that, or reducing future toil, as in automating those things that we talked about earlier. Okay. Um, now, one area of toil that we found is fixing broken automation, which we'll, we'll have a look at a bit later. But first of all, what's automation? Well, we hate those manual tasks, we hate that toil, so we automate it by getting computers to do it for us. Computers 
don't get bored, and they love repetitive tasks. Okay? I mean, computers are really set up for doing that same thing over and over again without getting fed up. Well, sometimes they run out of memory and things like that, but nothing, nothing too much. Um, and you know, without automation, we can't get the scale we need. We can't look after a fleet of thousands and thousands of machines with a relatively small SRE squad. Um, they're also faster than humans. They can fix problems quicker, if you program them right in the first place, uh, automation. Um, and also, humans can make mistakes. Um, so humans are not very good at doing repetitive tasks over and over again correctly. I mean, you may have the best run book in the world, carefully crafted, all the commands are right, all the right um, uh, syntax is there, uh, it might have the right description, um, and you follow it, and it works the first time, you follow it correctly, you follow it the second time, it's fine. I mean, a, a great example is that I've done it where by about the sixth time of running it within the month, you know, it doesn't happen every week, but you know, every day, um, I think I know better and I don't follow it correctly. I miss a step, um, and, and I think it's, it's good that we're amongst friends, because, I mean, and, and we all like to uh, share our um, war stories, but I was that person who typed the reboot command in the wrong command window, so instead of taking a single word and node down, I took down the entire cluster. Um, however, after the um, great talk by an, uh, uh, Nick earlier today, um, I know it wasn't human error, it was because of the uh, uh, operations around it. I didn't have enough safeguards around it. Um, but we can get rid of that by automating, and, and so that is a very part, important part of automation. Okay. Uh, and just a few examples, chatbots we use, self-healing, provisioning, deploying, how can you deploy a new uh, region? Uh, in, uh, in, in a short period without automating it, and, and self-service, which we'll talk a bit about later. So, so why does automation add to the toil? Well, actually, in the beginning, automation reduced the toil. Every week, we would have a reflection. We would look back at that previous week. We would look to see, OK, which incidents keep coming in, which tasks or tickets would come in um, repeatedly. Was it the same request for provisioning new machines or adding new users? Uh, or was it to uh, deal with um, a particular type of incident where we've run out of memory or something like that? We could identify the toil easily. Okay? Uh, we would identify the toil, and then we would put it into the backlog for the next week. We would prioritize it up high amongst all the features, um, and we would write either new automation or add to the existing automation, and we'd be really happy because we knew that immediately we were reducing that big pile of toil. But it was, it was probably a couple of years later, but over a period, um, we suddenly realized that the automation was started to add to our pile of toil. Um, and I would hear comments a bit like, um, well, I tried to use it, but the bot doesn't work anymore. It, it was sort of like, it was working last week, but for some reason it's not working now. Um, one of the more worrying ones, the automation stopped working. And it was, oh, I see the automation has stopped working. Um, and it stopped working about a month ago. Um, nobody noticed. It was automation that was only needed when we needed for a particular uh, incident. However, it should have been running for the month because we lost um, some data in, in the process of that. Um, and a great one is where, okay, somebody's changed the API and the automation hasn't caught up. We haven't got round to it, really. You know, there's just other things. Maybe um, we'll see why that, that may happen. Um, and what I like to call it is, is, is rot has set in. So rot of your automation has set in. And, and automation does rot over time. Uh, just like any code, automation needs constant care and feeding. Okay? Um, and, and the reason for that is that dependencies may change. Okay? Um, dependencies um, such as you might be using a different infrastructure or user provisioning services. Um, a great example we had was where we changed our change management system to ServiceNow. Um, all the automation that touched the change management system was then broken. Or, even worse, it was parts of it was broken. And, well, we'll leave the other bits where they were, but it could still do the capability, but don't forget, you need to manually go and get a change request first before you run this automation. So suddenly, the advantage that we had wasn't there. Uh, dependencies change, requirements change. Um, 
examples, uh, uh, one example we had was where uh, IBM started supporting an, an, a European Union cloud model where only certain SOEs that were based in the European Union could access some of the machines which were also in the European Union. And that meant that the whole raft of our automation suddenly where we had to think about, well, who can access it? Does it give access to customer data? Does, is, it, uh, is it affecting those customer um, environments? Um, and so that one requirements change meant that there was a whole raft of automation, which once again, was it, did we, did we actually spend time fixing it? Well, no, because we didn't use it very often, that sort of thing. Um, and we wanted to, we, we kept the automation, we could use it elsewhere, but there was this more toil, we had to do these manual tasks once we went back to the um, EU. Uh, SOEs change. Uh, we do a rotation system, we have people moving into the uh, SOE team and moving out. Somebody comes in, they write their pet project, they uh, have particular skills, um, and they know their automation really well, um, and maybe we weren't so good at sharing it, um, sharing the knowledge, and therefore, when the SOE left, that automation didn't get touched again. Nobody really knew. There, there was an extra barrier in trying to keep it from uh, uh, rotting, from, from just uh, stopping working. And of course, production systems change. I mean, simple level, it might be a different version of OS. So Ubuntu 16 to 18 or to Rel. Um, or it might be more widespread, where there is a large architectural change. Uh, when we first started out, we were dealing with individual containers. There wasn't Kubernetes at that point. It was Docker containers, individual. We had a set of tools. Um, we had a set of automation that worked with that. As the architecture changed so that we were supporting Kubernetes, on Kubernetes, on Kubernetes, then it meant that some of our tools, ones which dealt with the infrastructure, the machines underneath, were fine. But other ones didn't understand this new view. So production systems change. And, and all of that is that automation rots over time. You've got to look after it. Um, the other part is languages change. I mean, how many people have got Python 2 scripts automation that are moving to Python 3 or something else at that point? Um, but yeah, remember, just like any code, automation needs constant care and feeding. I mean, one which I haven't put up here is vulnerabilities. So vulnerabilities, don't forget your automation needs to be protected against vulnerabilities all the time. Um, and, and one reason why it rot is several reasons. Um, one is unused automation. So automation, and, and this is automation. I mean, IBM is a big company. We've got a large number of people, but I've noticed even in a small team, if you've got um, five people, quite often there's five different ways of doing the same thing. Um, but you automation written once by one team, but nobody uses it. Um, a part of that is it's not publicized. People don't know about it. Okay? Um, and so we spent effort to create it, but no one or very few people use it. And the person who wrote it, they want to keep it up to date because they do use it. They use it whenever they're on call, but you know, once every four weeks or something like that, it'll get used. But the rest of the time, it's, um, it's, it's, living, it's just gathering cobwebs. Um, we also suffer a lot, and I hope other people have the same problem, that we end up with duplicate automation. More than one way of doing the same thing. I mean, how many Slack bots can you have to do the same thing? Um, Examples we've got, we've got more than one way of interacting with uh, GitHub, GitHub Enterprise. We've got more than one way of interacting with our infrastructure as a service layer. Um, and it depended on who wrote that, that they were the ones who, they, they wrote it in a particular way and then didn't share it, of course. And, and you've probably heard it's, you know, of course that other team's automation is good. It just doesn't quite fit what I want it to do, so I'll, I'll, I'll write my own. So you end up with forks or even complete uh, duplicates. Um, and then there are maybe too many tools. So the more tools you have, the more automation you have, the more you have to maintain. So simply just the volume, and that was at least part of our problem, we just had too many different tools, overlapping tools, doing slightly different things, more than one way of doing the same thing. And the more you've got, the more you are having to maintain. And some tools may not get used for weeks or months. And the danger is, when you come and use it, like the one earlier I was talking about, it doesn't work. And you then waste time, toil, either fixing it, trying to work out exactly how to manage it, how to, you know, where did it go wrong, or fall back to the manual way, if you can remember how to do it. Hopefully there was still the run book was still there. Um, it's also, the more there is there, it's not always obvious which tool should be used to solve a problem. Um, I had an example only the, um, a, a few months ago where somebody was trying to fix a problem manually 
in their shift. They were about an hour and a half into fixing this manually. Um, and then the shift change gave over. They handed over as part of our normal handover process to the next shift. And the, uh, and the, um, the SRE on core who was just going on core said, oh, that's all right. I know how to do it. I've got a tool that typed a few commands, and sure enough, it was fixed within a few minutes. So that's a great example of where it wasn't obvious to everybody what, what tool solves the problem. Um, and automation can add to system complexity. It can make things worse because there's only a limited amount that we can keep in our brain. We, we've got to be able to somehow look for things and search things. Um, and when you're dealing with quite a complex environment anyway, the production environment anyway, which is going to be uh, probably necessarily uh, complex to support multiple use cases and capabilities. If you add in the automation as well, which can also be very complicated, uh, just to aside, we do deploy on Kubernetes, of course, our automation as well. Um, when it doesn't work, where do you start looking? Okay. So what, what I don't want you to think is that I'm going uh, I'm completely against automation. Automation is good, okay? It really helps you. Um, it solved my problem where I type in the wrong terminal window because no longer do I need to write in the terminal window. It's, it's automated. It will fix itself. Um, and, and also, for those other reasons we said before, it's great at reducing toil. Okay. However, toil is bad. Okay. So, so, okay, so automation is good. Toil is bad. Um, hopefully seeing that automation can lead to toil. But... Even worse, often the toil for that automation work, those fixing, changing the dependencies, fixing vulnerabilities, moving to another language, it, it comes out of the project improvement work bucket and not immediately, obviously, part of the toil bucket. When you're measuring it, you don't think of it as a repetitive team ticket or repetitive incidents. You think of it as project improvement work, but actually it's toil. So you're creeping down so that you're spending more than 50% of your time dealing with toil. Okay. Um, so, what do we think the solution is? The solution is to reduce the toil caused by the automation. Okay? So, automation good, toil bad, but how do we reduce the toil caused by the automation? Um, and at this point, I'll, I'll hand over to Cam to uh, talk about it. Thanks, Colin. So, how do we uh, minimize rot potential? I'm going to go through a number of our discoveries and our experiences. Uh, some of them you might go, oh, yeah, that's really obvious, and some of them, hopefully, you'll have to take some value out of. I'm going to start with one of the most obvious ones, um, and yet it still eludes some people, which is automation is development, so we should treat it as such, and we should build it as a developer. We should have it cleanly architected. We should design it. We should properly test it, including unit tests. You know, we need a full deployment uh, mechanism, and we should um, actually have it running somewhere that's looked after, not just sitting on, you know, a script sitting on my laptop or something. And, of course, the last point is uh, it should be properly maintained. Yes, maintaining our automation is a form of toil. Uh, unfortunately, there's no getting away that you will need some toil. Um, but hopefully the other steps will, uh, will avoid the majority of it. So the next step, I think, is a little bit more subtle, which is actually that um, something that's been mentioned quite a few times in this, uh, in this conference, uh, I've noticed, is self-service tooling where you don't necessarily need full autonomy. Um, you can usually get away with building something that someone can just call. Um, but there's a, a subtlety that might be missed here, which is that you want to build something that both can be called by people, SREs, but also provisioned to allow services to be able to call into it. And this allows us to build up a microservice architecture which um, will enable certain, uh, certain advantages yeah, as, as you move forwards. Um, and because we're talking about a microservice architecture and uh, allowing other services to call our automation, our um, tooling, we should also call into other people's tooling. Most specifically for a project, the biggest value I've noticed is um, calling into uh, tools that are built by developers. A good example we have is that we're running in Kubernetes quite frequently. We all want to drain the work off a, off a machine so that we can do something with it. Um, Kubernetes actually provides a command to do that. However, if anyone's used that command on a busy system, it often times out, it often can, can fail in interesting ways, and you've got some things that are removed and some things that are not. And then you've got these containers or these, these pods that are not necessarily, you're not necessarily sure whether you can 
can I just delete them? Do I need to do some recovery actions? Have they, have they taken a lock, and now we need to do some tidying up? So um, from our point of view, the, we've got the developers who've written a, a just, it, it is just a simple script, but they deploy it properly um, to all the machines. And there's this script then wrappers the Kubernetes function and allows our um, uh, a higher level of understanding to be built in. So when they do find a problem with draining a, a, a machine, they can fix it. And when they develop something that requires a bit more hand-holding to be, um, to be uh, removed from a node, they can actually build that in, and we don't even need to notice. So they're doing the maintenance, and we're getting the benefit without any actual risk of there being rot here. So what kind of automation do we build? Well, let me introduce you to Igor. He's one of our favorite um, and most loved automation bots. If any of you have read uh, Discworld and Pratchett, you should be intimately familiar with uh, the concept of an Igor. Um, he is, uh, he's the embodiment of this. He's a doer, not a thinker. You tell him to go and do something, he's very skilled. He will go on and do that thing. But at no point does he ever take action on his own. Um, so we talk to him over Slack tell him to do a thing, and he'll keep us updated and let us know how it goes. And if things go horribly wrong, he will tell us. Um, so what kind, of, um, what kind of actions and tooling do we actually build into our ego? Well, the, big, the, the best advantage I've noticed, uh, best thing to build into him, is big hammers. Not necessarily this hammer, more along the concept of the saying, which I definitely heard several times this conference, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you can turn that round slightly and say, well, we want our tool to be used a lot, why don't we design our hammer so that many errors behave as nails? They don't just look like nails, they behave like nails. So when you give it a good whack, it's gone. That's what we want. So then, well, how big a hammer do we need? In our, in our container space in, in Kubernetes, Restarting the container is trivial. You know, you just go, dead, it'll come back. Um, and, that, and, you know, and so we didn't really need to build any automation for that part because it's kind of built into our environment. But quite often machines get unwell. They occasionally need a bit of a kick. So rebooting the machine, you know, something that will drain the node nicely and, and tidy it up, restart it. Oh, if it's not restarting properly because maybe, maybe the kernel's hung, it goes in and gives it a hard restart from the, uh, from the underlying infrastructure. Um, and then when it comes back, make sure it comes back healthily and then allows work to be reprovisioned on it and comes back and goes, yeah, it's good. That's great. That's one of our first things that we added to Igor and uh, it's been very effective. Sometimes a reboot just isn't enough. I need a bigger hammer. So the next one we built was reloading the operating system. So, you know, sometimes if there's a, if there's a kernel problem or, you know, a base level operating system issue, uh, rebooting doesn't work, so, but reloading to a known safe good state is really useful. Of course, the reboot in the middle happens, but there's a whole pile of additional work around the outside. Uh, and this has been very effective, and we've had this for a little while now. I'm currently in discussion with the next level, so with developers on the next level of, um, of Hammer, which is, um, why don't we reprovision the machine? Sometimes, actually, even reloading the operating system isn't sufficient. We want to move over to a new, you know, different CPU specification or different memory footprint and so on and so forth. So actually, if we know what it should be, and it isn't, why don't we just reprovision it and it'll go and provision it properly, you know, it provision it properly with the new version. And of course, if you've got reprovisioning, that means you've got deprovisioning and uh, adding back in, so you can do a lot more control, fine-grained control in an environment. But you know, this isn't, that isn't the end. We've got many more options that we can go down. For example, our, our environment is, um, is replicated. It's, um, it's redundant over three sites. So in theory, in theory, we could deprovision an entire data center. Don't look at me, Ralph. We could deprovision an entire data center, throw it away, and build a new one, and no one will notice. <laughs> um, but and, you know, that, that's not the biggest one I can think of. Of course, the biggest one I can think of is we delete the universe and we recreate it. Um, for those who are more philosophical, um, you may have heard of the thinking that um, uh, the in between every instant in time, the universe is destroyed and recreated. 
Yeah? Um, maybe that's not actually a philosophical point and more an operational point. So moving on, oh look, a nail. It's, um, it's 20 to 6 uh, in the evening. I've got a node. It's not working very well. I uh, tell Igorina, there's a little bit of foreshadowing if people are uh, paying attention, um, to go and reload this machine. She raises a change request. She gets permission. She get, you know, once she's got permission, she then starts doing it. And I can leave her alone. And she'll keep me updated as the progress goes. And if it goes wrong, she'll let me know. But generally, you can just trust her to get on with it. And I can go on with enjoying my evening, or starting to enjoy my evening. So how about moving on to maximizing our usage to, to minimize rot? Colin said that things rot when you don't look at them, and they're not used. So let's encourage that. Let's place it somewhere prominent. Our obvious favorite place is a Slack bot. Uh, many people naturally put something into, say, a Jenkins job. But has anyone actually looked for a Jenkins job in a hurry when things are on fire and realized that there's 10 Jenkins servers and hundreds of jobs on each of those Jenkins servers? You are never going to find this job when you need it. So put it somewhere easy that anyone can find. But also make it as easy as breathing to use. Notice when I talked to Igorina, all I said was, this is the machine I want you to reload, and I'm not going to cause an outage when we do it. Um, that's literally the two things I said. And the outage thing is more from an auditing point of view to say, yes, I didn't really mean it when everything went on fire. Um, but it's got to be as easy, because well, I didn't say, for example, it's this operating type, operating system, sorry. It's in this region. It's in this data center. What VPN you need to use. She figured all that, all that out for herself and um, so that I could get on with my day. And the opportunities for making mistakes are much, much lower. Also, let's promote the, the uh, automation. You know, we've got to give playbacks. We've got to educate people. There's been a lot of talks that I've talked on that, so I'm not going to go into it in detail, of course. But um, you know, we need to make sure that people are A, aware of it, and B, they're confident to use it. And when we come to runbooks, um, if you're relying on a runbook to tell you how to do stuff and there's automation, the first line of the runbook should say, here's the automation to do it. Do that. And if it fails, here's the instructions manually. Or you know, if things are not going well, here's the back out. And also remember that success the best measure of success I've had for these automations is people raising issues on it. Because then they're using it, they want it to work, and they've invested time not only in trying to use it, but also in spotting problems and you know, raising, raising issues. So as long as you fix them, toil, um, you're good. OK. So dealing with rot. You know, we can't avoid rot forever. You know, at some point, rot is going to creep into the system when you're not looking. So um, some of this is, um, is uh, sorry, I'll start again. Uh, one of the, the first aspects of dealing with rot is to kind of not really love it as much as you, did the, you, sh you could well do by minimizing the effort you've actually invested into this automation. You know, one of my favorite lines from Agile was, um, it's the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. And in this case, we should, if we approach it with a very strict MVP, uh, we can see whether our automation is getting used, whether it actually solves the problems we first approached, um, approached this automation to, to solve. Um, you know, we don't need to deal with all the corner conditions, not initially, um, because there's an SRE driving it. So you know, if Igorina goes, oh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know um, how to deal with this obscure operating system, um, you're on your own. You're oh, okay. Right. Well, at least you tried, you know. <laughs> uh, and then, and then, if it turns out that that obscure operating system becomes prevalent, we can add that code in. But at the first point, we don't need to deal with strange conditions, and just defer to SRE when something happens. And another point of this is let's encourage actually a bit of survival of the fittest. You know, when rot has set in. We shouldn't be assuming that um, the current approach is necessarily the best one. We've learned a lot by building this automation and running it and using it. And our knowledge now is far better than it was when we first approached this problem. So is, you know, take this time to reflect. Is this the best way to approach this problem? Can we do it in a better way? Um, and also, you know, as Colin alluded to earlier about um, how your automation uh, can be very uh, 
uh, have a very low usage rate, maybe actually we're investing more effort in maintaining it than we are in, um, in you, you know, that we're getting benefits back from using it. So, you know, when rot set in, it's often most humane to put it down. Uh, and this was my last message I ever sent to Igor. I know you've all grown very attached to him over the earlier slides. Um, but he, uh, yes, he, he, he was put down uh, at the end of last year uh, because the internals of him, whilst we approached it with, a really, with, with great hope and vigor, um, we found out that there were some fundamental flaws in how we'd, how we'd approached it. But we didn't just throw him away and you know, discard the whole thought process. We took this as an opportunity to learn. And uh, this is where Igorina came in. Um, and um, you may say that she, uh, she is, uh, has a few parts from Igor. Um, there's quite a number of um, bits that were just lifted out of Igor and placed into Igorina. And as you see at the top, she's actually got still all the same kind of fundamental shape. She's still used by SRE and developers over Slack, and she's still a doer, not a thinker. But we took that opportunity, uh, the opportunity of, um, of needing to invest time into repairing the rotten Igor, to in fact approach the sort of core of Igor in a very different way. And now she's got a REST API. And you get that. She, the way we built it is we get that for free whilst you're building a Slack API. Um, she's auditable. So via change management, she tracks everything. Um, and her, um, her messages uh, that she would send to a human, she actually also stores into the change request. So that if, you, if someone says, for example, when we get audited all the time, when we get, uh, they, the auditors can ask, well, what actually happened here? And we can go down and say, well, here was the request. This is what happened. This is what, what um, the bot did. Oh, and here's all the messages that came out. We get a very good picture of what, um, what the behavior was. And the other thing was she, we actually took, a, took this opportunity to shard her because we found that when she started to get more popular, we actually didn't have a good time to um, deploy new code. So we built it to a sort of sharding model where we had multiple instances of her running and we load balanced across the work and then we were uh, load balanced the work across her uh, and then we were able to take shards down and upload new code whilst, whilst allowing other work to just carry on. Um, so, what was I gonna say? So yeah, that's, uh, that's our, um, our general approach with automation. And I think Colin's going to uh, give us the uh, conclusive summary. Yeah, I mean, just, just a very brief um, summary. So, you know, do go away. Automation is good. We do need automation. We need to make sure that automation um, makes our lives better as SREs. Um, but, and, and we know already toil is bad. But how do you reduce the toil produced by automation? So, so remember that builders to developer. Use common tools. Use clean code, test-driven development, consistent platforms to stop the rot. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get, we, you know, we didn't have time to go into all of that part. But the important thing is to remember software engineering as well as SREs. I mean, obviously, SREs are better than just software engineers, but, you know. Um, maximize the use of your automation. That's the way that you can make sure you have only what you need, you don't grow out of control, um, and you can reduce the amount of toil um, with managing loads and loads of different tooling. Um, if you was used every week, every day, then it naturally keeps current and people use it, you get the benefit out of it. Um, and also treat your automation as evolutionary steps. I mean, just like any architectures, you know, know when to throw it away and start again. But remember, it isn't just throw it away. Normally, there's a transition. There's normally learn from the previous one. You know, not, Don't assume that you can automatically uh, build something better straight away. Um, anyway, a few contacts there. Um, and do we have, uh, so well, thank you for listening. And hopefully, some of that you can take away with you. OK, thank you. <laughs> so we've got time for a couple of questions. Have anyone got any? I wonder if we have a weakness in our terminology here. That I, I agree that there's a dichotomy between valuable engineering work that's clearly useful for promotions and the company and impact and stuff, 
and there's stuff that isn't that, and we've called it all toil. But I wonder if this is better described as maintenance cost. Mm. Um, and someone said that I agree with, one of the things that's not appreciated is every time you write a line of code, you're writing a call option on maintenance work. And we don't necessarily think like that, and we don't have good ways of measuring that cost. Yeah, so it is, it, as I was saying, it is hidden quite often, um, that work, because it's not seen as something that is, um, you know, once you've automated it, well, you know, somebody's got to maintain it and things like that. We, we treat it as toil because of that repetitive nature of having to keep updating it. Um, you can get away from that toil if you're, we, um, if you're having to manually uh, rebuild it, things like that, of course, with CI, CD pipelines, with the automation and things like that. Um, but I, I see your point where maintenance is another way of looking at it, which in general we don't see as part of that project improvement work. So it's where in that line? Is it, is it project improvement or is it in that toil line? Is there another line in between with the maintenance? Yeah, no, it'd be good to explore that further. After. Um, kind of, hello, down the front. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, exploring that further, have you looked at um, trying to add maintenance APIs as part of your product development plans? Like, a thing that I have come to believe recently is you define your user-facing API, then you define your maintenance API, then you start building stuff. Like, I think a lot of this comes from yeah. the, well, we have a thing that's useful to users, we'll just, like, knock it together and run it in prod. If you define the maintenance API up front, then it's maintenance of the product, it's not maintenance of the automation, right, is one way I ponder about. Yeah, I mean, we, we love APIs. I mean, everything's a microservice, REST APIs. Um, and, and we do find that when we first started out, we had SRE very separate from the product development. We were a little bit too isolated, whereas now we work much closer so that you can build that in as part of, uh, and, and I agree. There, there's several different ways. I mean, I, I think the key thing here is remember we're software engineers. Build it just like a production system. What we want to do. Mm. I, would, yeah. I would like to add that um, mm. certainly our, um, our bots that we've built, we realized that we actually had to add maintenance APIs into them. You saw the last command I ran to, for Igor was quiesce terminate. That was something we actually had to bolt into Igor at some point because he was off doing something very exciting, which was not entirely what we wanted, and we needed to turn him off. And at the end of the day, we had to go in and we had to delete the container to stop it from continuing. And at that point, we realized that there's a distinct need for um, you know, maintenance and operational APIs as well as um, as well as just functional and consuming APIs. 